and it is uh, Lancaster Witcher's Weekly Coffee Hour. My name's John Kelsey. I'll be your moderator this morning. I see uh, 35 on screen. We usually get into the 40s someplace. Um, I have to confess I'm way behind in editing, editing videos, and I may just skip some for a little bit. Um, it, it's, it's just a regular ongoing chore, and I've been more interested in being in the workshop. Um, this week, I had an actual, a very interesting revelation in the workshop. I decided to do some flat woodworking, which I haven't done in years. I used to make furniture, but my shop isn't set up for that anymore. My shop's a wood turning shop. So, you know, I have a bandsaw uh, and a chop saw, but I don't have a table saw. And I have a small jointer and a small planer and some stands. So I needed to set up the drill press for mortising and, and joint and plane and try and get actually straight and out of twist and nicely square some pieces of wood to make a uh, storm door, a screen door with. Uh, I, I discovered anew what I was taught many years ago, that preparation of stock is fully half the work when you're doing flat woodworking. You're going to spend half the total time just getting the material ready to lay out and cut joints and fit or whatever it is you're going to do. That's why I like wood turning. It doesn't have any, any crappy piece of wood. You can put it right on the lathe right away. Uh, but I still find, even in the boxes that I make, that preparation of the blank is is really important. If I get a good square tube blank, I'm going to get a nice box. And if I don't, then I'm going to have problems throughout. So it's, uh, you know, that's wood, uh, that's woodworking. Uh, I see a bunch of hands up. Anybody, uh, announcements? The Lancaster picnic is the 5th of July. We moved it back to, to skip, to avoid uh, anybody giving anybody a conflict with the regular Susquehanna meeting. So we have a lot of crossover members. I see half a dozen guys on the screen now who are members of both clubs. Uh, so that's the 5th of July. The uh, picnic pavil pavilion is opens at 5, and the burgers will be ready be by about 5.45 or 6 with Barry at the grill. Uh, so it'll, it'll be a nice event. Anybody who's in range of Lancaster and hasn't had enough of picnicking over the long holiday weekend, come on out on July 5th uh, to it's the park on, on Valley Road in Mannheim Township same place we were last year. Uh, any other announcements? Randy, what's coming up with Susquehanna? Uh, not very much, actually. Um, Bill uh, had a demonstration. He showed how you make a cube with, uh, with, the, with the holes in it. And I think he's going to show that today. So Yeah, he is. Yeah, he is. And uh, Lancaster Club, uh, we got a vote and agreement on the list of stuff the basic list of tools and chucks and whatnot we have to add to have the four lathes that we have in our uh, meeting space all ready to operate with everything they need to go. Um, and I think there's a little team of guys that have been very merrily spending $2,000 on all that stuff. Um, and as I'm the treasurer, I'm expecting to write some substantial checks. But we had a vote last meeting and everybody agreed that we should uh, put about half of our treasury to this to this and get the shop to be as spiffy as we as we'd like it to be. So I'm really glad that that's happening and, and that, that that has come along well. Uh, Barry, anything else you want to say about any of that? Uh, no, just uh, I've been talking with Matt about some things, some ideas, and uh, he's uh, he's pursuing it pretty well. All right. Uh, okay, we're going to do shows, shows and tells. Um, I see three hands up. If you want to show some stuff, put your hand up. I still see, keep, I keep seeing new people on here who haven't ever shown us anything. And I'm uh, continuing to issue the, uh, it's not a challenge, it's a welcome. Uh, we'd love to see your stuff. We'd love to have you introduce yourself by, by what it is you make. And um, nobody's going to say anything mean to you. Um, it'll be, a, it'll, it's always fun to do. So I encourage you guys to bring on your pictures. Um, Mike, you're on. Okay, um, I want to show a little box I made uh, last night. Uh, a little, little simple pop box, the uh, walnut and, and dogwood, loose loose fit. They're, they're, they're fun, they're easy to make, contrasting wood. And, but the interesting thing about it is I think the way you have to turn this to, to finish off the bottom. Uh, oh, I didn't. I didn't share the screen, sorry. No, we're looking at you. We got oh, you. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. you know, let's... Unless you're trying to show pictures. Oh, no, I don't need to show share screen. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, anyhow, what I was trying to show, I'm going to set that down, is 
you make a collet chuck like this. You take a thin wafer of wood, uh, press it up against the uh, uh, chuck, turn a tenon, uh, cut a hole or cut a slot on it in a bandsaw, put it in the chuck, and then you can take take this and stick it in here like this and clamp it down and then you can wind up finishing the bottom and putting any texture or whatever on it. This is a handy little chucking technique for a lot of projects. That's like a little jam chuck. Uh, call it. Okay. That's the, that's the yeah, slot. The yeah. slot in it allows compression. Right. Uh, a jam chuck, you've got to be accurate to a 64th of an inch with this little uh, DIY collet chuck, you only have to be accurate to a sixteenth of an inch. So bring that piece back up, that lid, if you would. You were talking, you were doing that to finish the bottom. I'd like to talk about exactly how you finish that bottom. Let's have a look at it. Yeah, there. So you're using the texturing tool, but do you make it like real smooth first? Yes, you have to finish it to to its final final grit before you texture, because you can't go back over top of the texture and. It's kind of like dyeing and a lot of other things. If you don't have a good finish, it's going to show up. You now, are you finished? Are you cutting that surface with your gouge, or are you cutting it with a scraper? Uh, I used an. I, I cut it with a gouge, then I come back with a negative rake scraper, and then sand up to about four hundred. So, do you think that I've been reading about this online, and I wanted to think, uh, maybe we'll get more views on it? Do you think that the scraper? pulls fibers out of the surface and leaves it a little rougher than a good gouge finish? Or is the gouge finish just a burnish and it's not actually any different? Or what do you think about that? Well, I don't know for me, I guess it depends on the surface, but on end grain of hard wood, like dogwood or bread prepare, uh, the negative rake scraper will just give it a glass, glass smooth finish where I would have a more difficult time cutting across uh, in grain with a, with a gouge and not pause or have a ripple somewhere that I've got to go back and try to clean up. And, it, and it's just, you know, so easy. It's so e easy is good. And, and easy with a negative rake scraper on, on hard in grain is not a problem. If it's soft maple or spalted wood, that'd be a different story. Well, in, in the same vein, how do you raise the burr in your scraper? And what do you think is, do you deal with like raising different burrs? Uh, like I've, I've been discovering I can raise one kind of burr from the grinder and another kind of burr using a, a burnisher. And then I recently was bought a, a carbide burnisher from Alan yeah. Lacer. Yeah. Uh, but I've always had a hard steel cabinet makers burnishers, which is what I've always used. And I don't really notice any difference. You know, I, I don't know. That's that's something I've had on my to-do list. To I, I bought a, a cheap mic, a microscope, uh, it, but it's it was so cheap it's hard to get it stable and get it in focus. So I could do some comparison, but uh, I think they both work. I, you know, and I think maybe the differences are pretty minor. I, I don't know. I I sometimes use the the the, the grinder and use the burr off the grinder. Sometimes I use a, a carbide. When you were talking about a hardened rod, the problem is the hardened rod burnisher that you get for cabinet scrapers is probably high-speed steel. And trying to burnish high-speed steel with high-speed steel, you're not likely to get the same results as you would a piece of carbide, like a, a carbide end mill. Or in this case, this was the end of a Dremel, Dremel burr that was used for cutting glass. Well, uh, so it's carbide. Most of them are high speed steel, but this one. Uh, but you can get end mills, used end mills from a machinist or something that's carbide, and it worked pretty well. However, well I, bought, I bought the I, carbide. I, will say, I was in a class with Glenn Lucas, and I was having a problem with negative rake scraper in that class. This is several years ago. And, he's, and, and I showed him what I was doing because this is, I learned this technique from Eric uh, Lofstrom up there in the, the Northwest. And, Glenn kind of laughed and said, yeah, that's too aggressive. He said, yeah, he followed Eric uh, in a number of number of clubs and everybody had one of these. And so Glenn Lucas doesn't like it. So it's like everything else. 10, 10 wood turners, 11 opinions. You got to pick the one that works for you. <laughs> well, the rod that Alan Lacer sells is three eighths in diameter. So I made a handle for it and, and there was a little burr on the end of the steel ferrule. So I went to the grinder just to, you know, ease that right off there so I don't cut my thumb on it. 
and I inadvertently scuffed the carbide rod with the corner of the CBN wheel, making me think, and just a little spot, it's not going to make any difference to how I use it, but it making me think that the carbide is softer than CBN. And I, and, and I always was taught you can't sharpen carbide on CBN. I, my understanding is you can sharpen carbide on CBN. It's, it's better to have diamond, but, but I, I, I don't know. I think they're probably close, but diamond I understand is preferred for sharpening uh, carbide. But but I know some people do use CBN apparently to some effect. There you go. Anybody else on this? I want to take the spotlight off yeah. Mike and see if we get any other points. In, since we get eleven opinions out of ten guys, any comments? Yeah, I'd like to to ask. A question um, about the, the negative rake scraper. We just had a discussion yesterday night um, with other club members about negative rake scrapers. And um, I just want to ask Mike whether um, you or where do you see the advantage of using a negative rake scraper um, versus um, an ordinary scraper? Um, that they both need a burr to cut properly. Um, that's that's clear. But um, why not just use a normal scraper? What's the advantage of the negative brake scraper in, in this case um, where you're using it? You know, it, it the jury's still out. I'm still playing with it. I switched over to negative brake several years ago, but now that I've been collaborating with Richard Raffin and watching all his videos, I've reground one and uh, made another one, a conventional scraper. I, for me, the, the negative brake scraper is less aggressive. Therefore, as a finishing tool, it is safer and easier to hold it flat. It's easier to get it inside a vessel like a box yes. and control where that tip is. Because the deeper you go with a conventional scraper, sometimes you're bumping that 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 rim, you know, of a small vessel, like, mm -hmm. like a, a small box. Whereas the negative rake, you can just kind of keep it straight and and just kind of flex it a little bit till you find find the middle that's that's my experience i can't get a flat scraper into the things i make okay over here i use a spindle gouge and then i don't use a scraper i just turn it and use it the same spindle gouge resharpened and use it as a shear scraper on the edge pulling from the center outwards now, do you think that leaves the same finish as a as, as a gouge cutter? I mean, scraper wood. I mean, yeah. I, does it pull fibers or cut them? It it cuts them beautifully, and now all I've used then is 300, 320 and four hundred grit sand. I don't even have to go down lower. Um, How do Don, you sharpen? I, I, sorry. How do I sharpen them? CBN. No, I'm sorry. I was going to ask you a different question, but somebody else was coming in. I want to give him the spot. Who was that? Go ahead. Yeah, I, I just wanted to ask Don um, or, yeah, or comment on that. I um, I tried the same technique and it works well, but I feel I have got more control over a scraper than I have um, on the or with a um, newly sharpened um, gouge, as you um, explained. So uh, control seems to be be easier um, with um, with the scraper than the gouge for me. Yeah, it's possible. It's I, I do it for speed, really, but I find it works perfectly well, and I get no tear out on ingrain whatsoever, as long as I the last cut is a resharpened gouge. Yeah. Okay. Well, how do you sharpen your gouge now, Don? Tell us what the gouge angle is. What's the included angle of the steel? It's it's uh, possibly a thirty degree angle. And it's shaped back. It's not a 45 degree on the gouge. It's, I could get one and show you later on. Um, yeah, that would be a help. It's very long. It's a long grind. Okay, a long, a long fingernail. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'll get I, one whilst uh, you're still talking. Oh, well, I have to agree with Don that uh, using a, a, a spindle gouge in that orientation works. And if you come straight off the grinder, you actually have a burr. So you basically have a negative rake scraper with a round edge on it. And it's just a matter of learning how to hold the handle to get the wood to metal contact where you want it. 
And I think that's what Richard always tells me or told us too is, you know, it's, uh, negative rake scrapers or conventional scrapers. It's all about where the wood contacts the steel. And that's like riding a bike. You can ride a tricycle and have lots of fun, or you can ride a two wheeler with training wheels. And then you take the training wheels off. So it's, uh, you do cool. what works for you. Bird, how do you do that on the bo inside bottom of an end grain vessel, like a uh, like a box? On the, uh, I've got a box scraper uh, that uh, and I, wor I work flat so with. I you, mean, can't so you, you can't you can't go, go in there with with your gouge and do that. No, you can't go in with the gouge. But like Don was talking about uh, doing a, a a final cut on a, from a, on end grain piece. When you lay the go the gouge over on its side like that, you're basically using that cutting edge as a scraper, but yep. you have the advantage of being a, a burr plus the angle plus it's really thin, and you 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 get a sense of uh, learning how to how to pull it across. It's practice, and you get a beautiful finish on end grain. I do that a lot, and it's quicker. Like Don says, it's just quicker. You just you got the tool in your hand. You I use a diamond scraper or a diamond hone on it and do a quick wrap on the diamond hone to put a small burr and do a finish cut. You don't have to change tools. Yeah. I, well, I think awesome the too challenge too. is on certain profiles uh, of, of work, such as like this little box where it's the rim is undercut. You can't really get under there with a spindle gouge. You've got to go to some other tool. So I use a hook tool and I've, I've discovered that if I make this negative break, it's just it, it's easier for me to control, keep it flat. I can roll it up on the edge. I can adjust it to get that burr, but I can get behind the lip where I could not get behind the lip with the spindle gouge. Yeah, that's where you're putting an undercut in the, just under the lid. Yep. Front. Yeah. This is the um, two gouges that I use. You hold them still. Okay, now Try turn them the slowly so we can see them all the way around. Okay. I would say that's a steeper angle than 30 degrees. That yeah, looks more like probably is. 45. Yeah, I never worry about degrees. I Once I've got it set, I use a jig for sharpening. I never sharpen by hand. What's the difference between those two gouges, Don? Uh, the, distant, the difference is the flute. I don't know if you can see the... Where's the camera? Yeah. Can you... One is hold them up again. Lift them up. lift them up a little higher. There we, yeah, there we can see them now. So right. one has a shallower flute or a different shaped flute. What, it's what a shallower flute. They're both three eight, but one's a shallower flute than the other one. And what's the difference in use? Why would you use one or the other? I can get a slightly different pitch on the point. If you look that way, I don't know if it's better that way. I see, yes, uh-huh. You, you've got slightly more rounded than this one. So where would you use one versus the other? Depending if I want to do the outside of box, one I would use, on, this one I use more like on the inside before I go into using a box scraper. And this one is more on the outside profiling. Okay. See, I find those subtle differences that master craftsmen make in their tools to be everything. And it takes a long, long time to get to where that makes any sense to you. That's <laughs> absolutely right. And then when I go into the shear scraping, I just turn it over to get the bottom edge just cut Lift it. it up. Lift it up and tell us oh, again. Yeah. I use this bottom edge and draw from the center at back. So the shear scrape is done with that bottom edge. It's yeah. done with the bottom edge, yes. But the, um, close, the top edge is almost touching the work, though, isn't it? No. Oh. No, you're, you're about uh, two o'clock. Okay. About that angle. So it's you're clear of the top wing. And you <coughs> get, once you've got your cut, you just draw it along. So bevel rubbing, twist, and bring it across the surface. And that box I showed you last week was made with these tools plus a box scraper for inside. All right. It helps anybody? Does indeed. Any questions for Don? Don, so. How about Mike? <laughs> I'm very interested in your work, Mike. Uh, I, I have a detailed gouge as well. I, I tend to use it for 
deep cuts where I don't want to use the skew and I use it for cleaning up tenons uh, down in the corner and a few other things where I want a sharper point and, and a little more steel than where I can hang over the tool rest rather than yeah. a conventional spindle gouge. So I use both of them. Yeah. I use them a lot. They're one of the main tools I use. Um, this this is John. This I'm is, a little, go ahead. Go right, ahead. Uh, um, I'm a little surprised or uh, or don't understand. Um, inside of a box, I was thinking using a uh, a bowl gouge as opposed to a spindle gouge. But you all are saying about using a spindle gouge. Yep. Could you yes. explain explain that difference or? Um, I have bowl bowl. <laughs> Bowl, bowl gouges, but I use them more for the bigger bowl. If I'm making a box, I use the spindle gouge and I bring the spindle gouge from the center outwards. I don't ever push it in until I get the bulk out. Once I'm getting the bulk out, I come from the center of the bowl and draw it on a twist in motion. I find that if you try to push it in, you're going to get vibration on that box. You're using that same spindle gouge on the inside, yeah? Yep. You bore a depth hole? No. Nope. Sometimes I might even use a spindle gouge to bore a hole. I often do that. Yeah. That works pretty good. Yeah. yeah. And then I bring it out from the inside to the outside until I've got down to a depth that I want, then I bring in the box gouge, box mm -hmm. scraper rather. Thank you. Yep. Arthur oh, mentioned, oh. Yeah. Arthur mentioned the Leonard Lee's book about uh, sharpening. Um, I'm not sure that Lee's micrograph pictures on sharpening actually show the difference between burrs raised in different ways. I'm not sure. And that was come out of Taunton Press right around the time I left Taunton Press. And I don't really remember the detail. I'd like to jump in here about, I'd like to say something about the, what Mike had recently talked about, the gripping things. And uh, I have, uh, I don't know if you can highlight what I have here. Yeah, we see you. Yeah, basically what I have is a piece of PVC pipe and uh, just cut a slot in it. And you can use that to grip a lot of things. If for some reason uh, it turned out that uh, you had a tendon that was too small or something like that, you could use this. This would not have as much control as what Mike created, but it's an option. That's a nice trick. I had never never saw that before. But the, the, the other one that I do when I come to the same type as uh, David's talking about and Mike, I've got soft jaws, which I make out of uh, MDF. And I cut, turn the circle, cut it into four and drill some holes so it fits my chuck. And then when I've got it up to a certain point, I can turn in there a certain number of holes and then you've got the same as you're doing, except it's in four jaws, not a single collet. You can actually buy blank jaws, at least for the one-way chucks. So the jaw is flat. You can drill your own holes and mount whatever you want on it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I did a little short article for AAW on those. I, I, frankly, I have not, I did not have good luck cutting that, cutting that plastic, um, those plastic jaws and, and be able to use them effectively for reversing a box. It, you know, the problem was I make different size boxes and, and the jaws never seemed to fit and it, and, You've really got to stabilize those things and have them tight just right. And it's, I don't know, it, it's harder than it, than it looks, I guess. Yeah. I'd be inclined to use white pine or cypress or something soft like that for auxiliary jaws in that situation. Be, be cheaper, probably easier. The, the, only, the only advantage of those, those ones you buy, they're already pre-drilled and the backs of them are cut to, to fit in the fix the, the groove on your chuck. So you're going to get a little more stability. Yeah, I agree with that. But I use um, the MDF I use is a green center MDF. It's not the, shall we say, the whole piece. It's a very um, 
beautiful piece of MDF. As I say, it's green inside with two coats on the outside, and it's ideal because once you've ruined it, you throw it away and you can make some more, and it's only cost you the piece of MDF. Whereas you buy these soft jaws, the nylon ones or any of the others, and you mess them up, you've just thrown away your the money that you spent on them. Are you talking about this this kind of what we call melamine? No. Or it's got a coat on each side? Yeah, no, this is MDF. No, okay. MDF has a uniform consistency. Uh, it's a little harder on the surface, but inside it's not all porous like the stuff you're looking at. Right. You're talking about you're looking at particle board there, which is quite yeah, a you're right. You're right. The furniture grade MDF is a very different material. Yeah, the, the one I use is not that. It's actually got a green center. Uh, we never saw that, but I'm sure it's around. It's probably out only over here. Okay, good, good chat. Sandy, what do you, how about you? Well, we don't know you yet or very well. What do you got? Well, first of all, uh, I'm not Sandy. Sandy is my wife. Okay. I'm Jeff. <laughs> uh, I don't know how she must have used my email for one of her Zooms, and therefore uh, I'm technologically You're, challenged. Is you, are you Jeff or Jet? Did you say Jeff? Jeff. Okay. I, uh, I, I've been turning on a shop smith like Arthur. Uh, I have not been assaulted by a skew, but I've been attacked by uh, shards of a shattering wood, apple wood bowl. Uh, I've had some successes. I have, let's see. Let me get, okay, you should be able to see that now. Yeah, pull it back closer to your face a little bit. Okay. That's good. Okay, I have a box. It's out of oak. It's a lid. Uh, it took me a long time to figure out how to do that, but I did it. I have a natural edge bowl out of dogwood. Nice. And until I came to the Zoom, I had no idea that there was such a thing as a final club or that I was a member. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> so I am, I, I am very much in the learning stage. I have an unfinished, uh, this is pin oak, and it has definitely warped and it cracked. And I need to go down another half inch deep before I can finish it off. I still have the tenon on. But uh, I also have a, an old Yates American lathe that is beyond my skill set to get back running again. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just learning and I'm, I'm getting a lot of information from uh, being included in, in these Zoom meetings. Now tell me, what kind of lathe do you have now that you're turning on? I'm, I'm turning on a shopsmith. Okay. Uh, do you ever convert to anything else, or do you just leave it in the lathe mode? Uh, here lately, I've been leaving leaving it in the lathe mode. I had one of those for a couple of years when I started. I thought it was a really good lathe. I really enjoyed it. It, it uh, very smooth. Uh, <clears throat> the the issue is it, it, when you start it up, it it starts up. At, I think it's a minimum of like six hundred RPM. Yeah. And uh, I've experienced what was it was mentioned once before of, of chasing the shopsmith across the floor. Anything uh, unbalanced, it's going to vibrate and bounce because it's lightweight aluminum all the way. Yeah. Yeah, I had to, I put two fifty pound bags of rock salt on the ways behind the headstock, and then that that held it down. But uh, yeah, I'm very much an amateur. I'm learning, and, uh, and 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 where in the country are you, or where in the world? Oh, I'm I'm in uh, Lancaster County, West End in uh, West Hempfield Township between Columbia and Mountville. Okay, so here around here, yeah. Yes, sir. Have we been seeing you at the club meetings, monthly meetings? No, uh, you're. I'm. I've been. Uh, I I got introduced to the wood turners through Doug Reeser. We hang out at the same sawmill. Oh, all right. Yeah, sure. How did uh, Bill uh, the Hollister? Bob Hollister's. Bob Hollister's, that's a very interesting place. Yes, it is. 
And I've noticed, I've, I've just in, in I've, I've made some observations in the club that a few months ago, they were talking about chisels. And uh, there were disparaging comments about one called the skew, but nobody mentioned it. According to my, my catalog, skew apparently is the only four letter chisel there is. <laughs> and I'm wondering, was, was that intentional? <laughs> I think Maybe. Cindy Drosta calls the skew the devil's can opener. <laughs> yeah, and then, and then another observation I make is there. There seems to be uh, uh, guild secrets with wood turners. They they use they consistently use a phrase more than most woodworkers, and that is, "Don't ask me how I know that." <laughs> Uh, it's comes uh, it's the same as the funnel club how did you get yeah. how, how, how did you come to join the funnel club well yeah. <laughs> you don't have to ask me how i know that <laughs> 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 nice to meet you nice to see your work sandy thank you could you bring that uh natural edge bowl back for a sec uh which one the, the funnel or the dog no the real one <laughs> is that how did you did you have any trouble with the mark on that uh, no, this one, this one, I actually, I actually uh, had had a pretty good success in getting it turned. Get and that's, that Yates up and running. Yeah, the Yates. I, I agree with Mike. What's what's stopping you from getting the Yates going? Uh, it's just beyond beyond my skill set. The the bearings probably need to be removed, repacked, or replaced. Uh, it it was a three phase converted to single wow. phase and that's not working right and uh right it's just beyond my skill set to, to repair it's a kid apart so how come you're giving it shop space then well that's what i'm that that's what i'm stressing over how, how to get get rid of that and is there a market for that and get something that that is more uh user friendly what is that lathe again Yates American. It's American. It's a J70. Okay. okay. It's an old industrial machine. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, Jeff. Sherry. Nice to see you. Oops, somebody's got a question for Jeff. I'll get Jeff, back to you. Jeff, before you go. Yes, sir. Uh, the uh, wood turners, the Lancaster wood turners, have a, an open house uh, coming up. I believe it's on the 8th of July. Uh, starts about 9 o'clock, lasts till about noon or whenever anybody lost loses interest but uh come on out bring your tools you can turn uh there are people there that, that can help you if you need help you don't appear to need help but uh come on out and, and have a good time the yeah. lasers are set up and running well that that if i can arrange that uh, that's usually saturday mornings it's usually when i'm down at the sawmill so uh I'll have to see how my schedule works out. People go out to Hollister's okay. place and you have to, if you go there, you have to sit around and talk for about two hours and then you might be able to buy some wood. Yeah, that's a requirement. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Sherry, what do you got? Hi. So um, Bert in Edmonton invited me. I, uh, I live north of Calgary in a, uh, a rural area. So... Um, Hi everybody, thanks. I've, I've been happy to just sit and listen, but I guess I, I should pipe up at some point. So um, I've got uh, I've got three different pieces that I'll that I'll show you. So we got one uh, one here is a uh, it's like my chair rolled away. Okay, this is a uh, a bowl that I made out of uh, Saskatoon berry French. How did you do that? Well, that that's another story. We'll save that for another. <laughs> it's, a, it's a it's a long and painful process, but it, it looks like little little slices, and I was uh, I was really quite pleased with it. Um, it's got uh, all these little these little marks that you see in there are uh, are from uh, a woodpecker pecking at the at the tree. So, anyways. Wow, that, I have no idea how you would do that. <laughs> Well, I can I can share that another time. What so, else are you going to show us today? 
Um, I have another place. Someone someone gave me a really thin piece of. Uh, uh, it's called um, yellow cedar. So it, it was like exceptionally thin. So I wasn't sure what I could do with it. So I ended up, I made, uh, can you see that okay? You got to hold it still. It keeps coming out of your blur. There you go. We're in. Oh, no, we here, just let lost me, it. Let me pull see. it back hold closer on. to your face or turn your blur off. There okay. you're good. If you just hold it still. Okay. Closer to your face. Back. There we, uh, there we are. We were there. <laughs> I mean, how do i how do i turn off the blur you gotta go under the video under the, by the little carrot beside the video uh uh blur my background unclick that okay, there you go. A... can you see it now yeah yes. now okay. tell us how you did that so i just turned your your basic thin platter um and then i I um, actually, I, I sandblasted that. I carved it with a, a sandblaster. So cut out the blast mask and protected the rest of the piece, blasted that, which gave a, a very sort of uneven surface on the, uh, around what, the part where it had been blasted. And then I painted that. And then all the little nifty little marks you see uh, around the perimeter, I just cranked the heat up on my pyrography pen and I made a homemade tip and I basically just branded it and then painted over top the whole thing. So it, so, so you must you have a sandblaster in your shop? Yes. And what kind of lathe are you working on? A uh, one way 2416. So and you've been I at have, this for a little while. Um. I guess I've been kind of more serious about it for the last five years, but um, I started initially in 2013, but I didn't have a lathe and then I, I took a course and by the time I saved up enough money to buy the lathe, I couldn't remember how to do some of the basic things. So it's kind of been hit and miss, but now I've uh, I've been focused on it. it. It's more of an addiction now. It looks like you're set up for flat woodworking there as well. Um, no, all I do is lathe work, but there is a um, there is a, a a table saw. So, but Did I you have another, another piece to show us. I got one more. Um, I call this my happy accident. Um, so late, lately, I'm I'm focused on the the multi the multi axis. Wow. Um, I I really enjoy doing. I really enjoy doing that. And again, I call it my happy accident because I made it probably, uh, I don't know, two two years ago. And then, um, yeah, my, my dad got ill. So as I, I kind of got away from uh, working on the lathe and then I decided I, I kind of liked what I made there, but I could not for the life of me remember how I did it. Um, so I have spent the last three months just going, you know, piece after piece after piece, which uh, I don't know if I turn my screen here, you can see a whole series of them there where I was just working and working, trying to figure out again, how, how did I actually accomplish that multi-axis piece? Because I'd spend a lot of time honing one surface and then I'd take it off axis and my next turn would take all the work that I just, you know, uh, neatly created. Uh, it would it would take it all out. So now I've uh, I made myself, I guess, the equivalent of a story stick, you know. So you can see I've got every single surface labeled with a with a number, and I got sticky notes on it, and you know, and and notes on the on the piece itself. So I have uh, finally, after I think about twenty. Uh, 20 renditions I have uh, I've now um, figured out how I did what I did so I can I can now do it repeatedly so are you using like a, a weights to counterbalance that because that's a pretty big piece to have off center oh no no I just use a vacuum chuck so it, yeah it does get a little adventurous sometimes does it yeah I'd say <laughs> <laughs> I try I, I try and set it up so that I like almost, I'd say about 95% of the time I can leave the tailstock in place. Um, so it, 
yeah, it does become challenging sometimes because it's hard to get the tool in at the right angle, but it's it's much safer because, um, as I'm sure you know, if you get a catch on a with a vacuum chuck, it uh, yeah. Pens. Yeah, it goes across the room or into your face. Uh, yeah. yeah. What Have wood been... is that last one? What wood is uh, that? The last one is a piece of uh, Manitoba maple. So it was rescued from a tree that was downed in southern Manitoba and uh, found its way to me. And I, I liked some of the, the marking and, and the figuring in it. So that allowed me. So again, if I just, if I just uh, bring it up. So I, I turned it, you know, the, the multi-axis and then the technique that I mentioned on the other one, I, I branded this ring. Uh, with the pyrography pen, I, I drew these by hand and, and uh, filled those in with the pyrography uh, pen again. And then it's just uh, translucent dyes, kind of similar to some of the, the techniques I think that Cindy Drozda shows. So you're kind of dabbing the dye on with a dry, dry brush. Is that how you're getting it to be like that variegated um, effect? Uh, no, I... Uh, I just used a, a piece, piece of um, flannel, huh. and, then, quite, and then and then if the if if the colors don't kind of blend the way you want them, then you just soak another little piece of uh, flannel in uh, isopropyl alcohol and just rub, you know, rub it, and it kind of causes them to uh, um, blend together. Cherry, that your work is absolutely beautiful. I'm really really impressed. And also now by seeing your shops, they'll take some of the uh, pressure off of me because they're always harassing me about how clean my shop is. Yours <laughs> outdoes mine. Yeah, well, I, I usually blur my background <laughs> and things like this, but yes, I'm, I, uh, I, I am very pleased with my, my, my shop here. It's uh, yeah, it, and I, I try to not use my flat surfaces for storing things. So every day when I leave the shop, I try and clean it up so that the next time I come in, I'm inspired to work instead of looking at, uh, what a mess. So sure. I, I don't think I actually have you on our mailing list, Sherry. I think you're getting the invites from Bert. Is that right? Uh, Bert sent me one invite yeah. and I, I copy pasted it and I just use it every time. It's the same link every week as it, it was most of you have figured out, so. But I just do send a notice every week, and and when I get videos up, I'll send another notice. But that'll happen sometime. I'm, uh, I'm sure. learning lots from this, so thanks. Well, sure, you're quite you. the, you're quite the artist, and from a wood turner standpoint, it's uh, going to be easier to learn the wood turning than it would to learn the art. I'm coming the opposite direction, and I am envious of you folks. You're such good artists when it goes to putting stuff on wood so congratulations oh, it looks I, beautiful i i appreciate but i i i don't agree i i do not <laughs> consider myself much of an artist it's just the i i hijack techniques from here and there and and put it together so for example like these these flowers in there like you might look at them and go well how on earth would you do that but i i simply took three different sized uh washers and i just i just drew you know drew circles uh so that i i had the different sizes and that the flowers are not complex to draw at all it's just really a a lot of time because you you're just you're using your pyro pen to just you know put in all the the dots in the negative space and yeah you, you, you kind of when you're done you go whoa I like you just yeah I wouldn't have believed that I could do that either so I I'd encourage you all just it's uh, yeah it, it's not that difficult I think your your technique of doing uh that series of practice pieces to learn to get your technique figured out and your centers figured out for multi-axis I think that's an excellent way to work for almost anything I've been doing the same thing with some of the things I make I make whole much more patience to make practice pieces and try different things than I had when I was younger and more impetuous. I just wanted to race to get it done and get on to the next thing. Now I seem to have the time to sit down and work through a series and actually learn something. Well, for me, it's like if I start making something and, and the, the second that it starts to look like I might be able to pull it off, I just feel like I'm committed and I don't want to do anything to wreck it. And so that, that has kept me paralyzed for, 
you know, a, a number of years, and then I and I had all this really nice wood squirreled away, and then I just decided, no, I'm I'm gonna just I'm gonna just go for it. So every every day I'm out here, and okay, I like this, I don't like that, and making notes, and um, yeah, so that that uh, that technique has worked. It served me well. And what town are you in? I'm not. I'm uh, in a rural area about 30 minutes north of Calgary, Alberta. Where Red Deer? No, no, I'm just out in the boonies here. Oh, Kinda, boonies. If, you, if, you're, if you're familiar with Calgary, Cochrane, and Airdrie, if you triangulate, I'm right in the center of there. Okay. So it's Thank you very much. G great introduction and beautiful work. Very impressive. Thank you all. Nice, nice to meet everybody. And thanks, Bert. Dave Delo. Good morning, everyone. Share screen. You there got you it? Go. Yep. Okay. And then I'll, uh, hey, that was um, certainly uh, symposium, instant gallery quality work there. Very nice. Very nice. Well, hey, a, a couple months ago, I think it was in March, we discussed a couple different times uh, uh, feather and flame and uh, uh, crotch feather, that type of thing. And I showed this picture at that time. And uh, uh, they, weren't, they weren't finished, but I at that time, I was uh, in the process of uh, going through a bunch of uh, smaller logs that I had and uh, uh, just wasn't ready to uh, show everything uh, that I'd done. I, so I did maybe uh, 30, 40 pieces, and uh, I finished off uh, uh, about a dozen of them here recently, and uh, just wanted to uh, show you that. But um, before I start, you know, uh, Powermatic has this uh, saying about uh, the gold standard since, uh, I don't know, 1925 or 1921, something like that. And this is a piece that I did, I don't know, five, six years ago, but I've always held on to it because when uh, I'm going to do a crotch, be a once turned crotch piece, um, this is what I'm looking for. I'm looking for the little uh, white lines in it uh, with the feather uh, in it. And uh, this one is just about as perfect. I give it about an eight and a half out of 10. And I wish the uh, feather would go uh, just a little bit more uh, on these top two feathers, but even in, you know, on the backside. But just to give you an idea, that's sort of like the standard that I'm looking for. That, that's what, you know, and I know this is all personal opinion, but this is what, this is what I really like in a crotch piece. Okay. A beautiful piece, a lovely piece of wood and a beautifully turned too. So I, I've got, uh, I'll, sh I'll show you a, a few of the pieces out of uh, uh, different species that I've recently done. And here we got uh, uh, sycamore. Uh, and this is, did a uh, heart-shaped uh, once turned bowl and then uh, a regular bowl out of, uh, out of the other side of it. And a little bit of close up of uh, the... Uh, uh, just hold, still there for, hold on for a second there before you go on. What I'm noticing in this sycamore is some really strong ray fleck. The, 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 rays, the ray cells are making this little checkerboard pattern whenever you're dead, dead on cross uh, quarter sawn. Exactly. And sycamore is known, known for that. And uh, you get a little bit of that in this piece here, the, the flatter ball yep. right here. Okay, so that was out of sycamore, and th this one really wrinkles up uh, quite nicely. Okay, um, and here's a, a piece of oak that, that I'd done, and I really didn't get much out of this except a bark inclusion. Okay, and uh, uh, then a, a once turned uh, walnut piece, a little bit close, close up uh, of that, and that uh, uh, bark inclusion does go all the way through, so it's hollow most of the way all the way through here so that was a, a little bit of an adventure to keep it keep it together but uh, uh, then a, a maple piece uh, once in a heart shaped and now uh, once where uh, sometimes when when I you got the uh, three pieces of the Y and that uh, that third piece is a, quite a bit smaller than either the main trunk or or the one branch uh, sometimes for me anyway it's uh, a little bit difficult 
when you put it between centers and you're trying to even out everything, it just doesn't work. The arithmetic just doesn't work. So I'll, I'll cut it a little bit more like a traditional bowl and then uh, leave a small section with the, with the bark on, okay? And this one came up uh, nicely, except for um, a little bit of discoloration in the uh, feather on this one. But I, I kind of like I kind of like the feather on uh, this this maple piece. Then uh, moving on to a little bit of cherry, and uh, I really like these two pieces. I, I get the what I'm looking for uh, uh, in with the uh, I don't know if you call this uh, chatinance these uh, the white streaks that are in it or not, but uh, just to give you an idea. Yeah, that is chechoyance is what I'd call that that shimmer that comes when you chip it in the light and it reflects off the off the the very stressed wood cells in there. It's beautiful when you, you get that. The, these the, these cherry pieces came out very nicely. So you're really going for the feather, aren't you? That's really what yeah. you're into. You yeah, know? that that's all I care about. And, I, and none of these are really large. They're all seven, eight, nine inches in diameter. Then uh, another cherry uh, heart shaped bowl and. Uh, than a cherry uh, uh, natural edge that I. I, now, I that natural I, that natural edge piece that wall thickness looked to be about an eighth of an inch three sixteenths. Yeah, it was about a sixteenth of an inch here and just barely an eighth of an inch here. How about and, down toward the bottom? Does it get thicker? Yeah, uh, just just a hair. It's it's a heavy eighth inch, and. Right. Out of this, I, I I turned it fine. This was a spring cut, and uh, uh, the uh, the all the bark stayed on it, and I, I lost it when I was sanding it. So, a little bit closer view. This one had a little. I can I can uh, put this one on the wall. <laughs> nice little home homemade uh, uh, hole in it. Sideways so, funnel. <laughs> yeah. So then these was another uh, cherry. And th this was uh, uh, some spectacular uh, wood. I've, I've never seen uh, a, a piece like this with three distinctive, uh, you know, you get your, your grain here. And uh, uh, I don't know if you'd call it a burl, but th this is the other side of the log and then the sap wood. And um, that's just, and so you really, you really got to know what you're going for when you're sawing the wood. I mean, if you saw that wrong, you're going to lose that feather. It doesn't run very thick. Usually I, I cut a lot of people right down the middle. Sometimes I do that, but if it's a smaller piece, I'm going to go a little bit on the right side and I don't care what happens on the, on the smaller side. I'm going to keep the bigger side and then turn away to where I want it to be. So you're, you're going for, a lot of people are going for maximum yield out of that. You're not, you're going for the diamond. The wood's free. I can get it just about everywhere. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, I don't really care about that. That's Dave, a nice approach. That's a really good approach, I think. I applaud that. And the the idea that we that, have to use every scrap of wood, I, I think we should just select a good wood, the, the wood that does what we want to see in it. So here's the, the class picture of the ones that I finished here. And I give myself a an A on several of them and a, a B on a couple of other ones and an F minus on uh, a couple of them too. So, <laughs> Well, these two in the foreground here on the right side of this picture of the, with the figure, I think those are two spectacular pieces, those two. Yeah, really really cool. like yeah those are, you, you hit it dead on. You couldn't just make very beautifully done. Thank hey, you. I have a question for you. Yeah. Is when you're turning that bowl down, is that feather the whole way, or is there a sweet spot in the depth? You never know until you open it up. Okay, so that's why it almost, was almost, almost like a burl. You know, you never know what you got until you open it up and start uh, slicing and dicing a little bit. Okay. Okay. That was my question because I'm about to split open a London plane. And I'm trying to figure which way to cut it to get that. So, yeah. Well, I think he's right. You, uh, the idea of splitting it down the middle and trying to get feather on both sides of the saw cut, I think that's the mistake. I think you want to just go for one piece out of the crotch. I mean, if you're trying to do what Dave's doing, you go for the one piece out of it and 
don't worry about trying to get a second or a third piece. Just go for the gold. Okay. No, uh, that's that's all I got. That's all I know. That's all I got. Okay. Thank you very much, Dave. Really a lovely way to wind up a very I, I have a question for Dave. Yeah, go yeah. for it. What when you're cutting these uh, crotches, um, do you have any concern for the pit? At how you're dealing with that or where where your placement of the uh, of your cut in relation to the pit? No. I I and if, if I cut it on the say I cut something uh, down the middle, I usually get rid of the pith, okay? If I'm cutting on the, uh, one side or the other, yes, I'll have a pith there, but oh, it, that ends up getting turned away uh, while you're uh, trying to discover exactly uh, what the feather looks like and you know how long it is. If, it, if you could make a, uh, a real bowl out of it or if it's gonna be more of a platter type shape, okay? Hmm. Okay. I think. Uh, Thank you. My opinion. 30, uh, I see 39 other participants, uh, 45 different opinions. Roughly, yeah. We are on the hour. Um, Bill, Bill Tat and Kai, I'm going to invite you guys to stay on with me after and we'll get your screen share figured out. Is that okay with you guys? Yes. Okay. I'll, I'll be. I'll you be stay on, on and, and Kai's going to stay on. He knows what to do. And we'll figure out anybody else who's wanting to learn how to screen share, you could stay on and we'll do that too. Otherwise, we'll see you all next week. Yeah. Wood shop. Thank God for wood. <laughs>